Hi, everyone. Um, hi, Lily. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Lillian? I'm good. How was your Fourth of July? It was. It was pretty good. Um, you know, um, the usual family time. Yeah. <laughs> Not a lot of things, you know, are open, but um, but you know, it's uh, we're 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 healthy and 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 that's what matters. How about you? The same. Uh, a lot of home time, but definitely um, try to enjoy our nation's independence. So welcome to everyone um, to Coast to Coast. Um, my name is Lillian Corral, and I'm joined by my um, colleague, Lily Weinberg. And uh, this is our weekly uh, show on the future of cities. Um, so last week, we took a little bit of a hiatus, um, but we've been talking about some very like interesting and sort of interesting topics around exactly what's been happening in our city. So Lily, I don't know if you want to give us a yeah. little bit of a rundown of what we've talked about, what we've learned sure. so far. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's certainly been an interesting journey, I would say. Um, yeah. You know, and we've been on this now for for two and a half months. Um, yes. and, um, and, and so we started, um, you know, during this very dynamic time, um, looking at the future of public spaces, what that means um, in context of, of COVID. Um, we, we then um, did a, a deep dive into some of the equity issues that we're seeing in our, our communities, um, uh, especially in context of the, the murder of, of George Ford. Um, and, and so we looked at um, St. Paul um, and had a, a really good conversation with their chief equity officer. Um, we also looked at, um, you know, what does it mean to do placemaking and, and at the intersection of, of equity um, and the arts. Um, and, um, and, you know, I mean, I think that it's, it's been um, a really fascinating conversation. This last one that we had two weeks ago was looking at cultural bridging, um, you yeah. know, and, and, and talking across um, races and and what does that look like especially um, as we think about anti-blackness um, in our communities um, and so I, I you know um, equity um, has has been a thread through all of the conversations and it's not just about the last three it's it's been a, a, a thread through it and I'm really interested yeah. um, in this next conversation that we're gonna have today around um, you know the digital world and 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 especially the the equity issues that that we're going to see um, um, elevated um, through that. So yeah, no, that's a great uh, recap. And it's funny we have been on this journey for a while now. So thanks to everyone who keeps um, who keeps joining us. So today you're right. We're talking about the digital public square, and we thought this was a good um, topic of conversation. I'm really excited by our guests because um, we have seen. Obviously, we can't all be out on the street. Um, and the spaces that we usually uh, take up to be civically engaged are no longer accessible to us. So we're all online. And what does that look like? What are, the, what are these trends? What does civic life look like? Especially um, if this pandemic stays with us for a very long time, which it definitely feels like it's going to be here for a while. And so how do we make sure we don't lose our civic life? Um, in this moment. So um, I'm really excited to kick it off and, um, and talk today with Mona Sloan and Warren Flood. Um, so Mona is um, a, um, a New York-based sociologist. Um, she works at NYU, um, and she's really been working at the intersection of AI, design, and policy, and a lot of her latest research really focuses on developing an understanding of how we're making these digital shifts as a society, especially right now during COVID, and where, um, so where we're populating these digital spaces, and frankly, where they're falling short. Um, and um, and how we can make sure that we are keeping everyone in our community engaged and an active part of, of community building. And then we also have Warren Flood with us, who is the Corporate Affairs Officer for Microsoft in Detroit. Um, he works with civic leaders, community stakeholders, and citizens um, as they tackle urban challenges. And prior to joining Microsoft, Warren um, has a history in data analytics both on the consulting side, but also having worked on uh, several political campaigns um, and, um, and with political um, efforts across the country. So thank you both for joining us. It's really interesting to have you here. Um, and so, as I said, today, you know, we're exploring the communities that we engage civically online and offline. And, um, and then obviously the outbreak of COVID really has shifted the way that we use these tools. Um, and we don't foresee any, any changes to our shelter in place strategy, especially not in places like 
where I live in Los Angeles, we're hunkering back down again. Um, Miami is, is closing down. Um, so let's start first by framing all of this. And I thought, Mona, maybe we could start with you. Um, you've used this word public as a practice. Um, with us. And so I, I thought maybe we could start by just talking about what it means to be public and um, and what you're seeing, how you see that play out as people are moving digitally uh, or making the shift into kind of just a more digital life, if you will. Thanks so much, Lillian and Lily uh, for, for having me and, and Warren also. It's such a pleasure and I'm so excited about this conversation. Apologies for the background noise. There's a car going off. Um, the joys of being, you know, in public city. and private uh, uh, at, at an yeah. event. So, yeah, so thanks for that uh, first question. So what I sort of try to think about when I think about uh, publicness as a practice is sort of on the one hand, critically examine what kinds of affordances of successful physical public space are being carried over into the digital practices that sustain our social life in the shelter in place uh, situation and in the lockdown, but also what that means in terms of the different inequalities and inequitabilities that we are seeing in public space, uh, both digitally and, and sort of physically. Um, and sort of to help anchor that sort of thinking and that framework, uh, what helps me thinking, doing that is basically think about three main points. The first one being, um, public notice as a practice, looking at how do people really do that? Uh, what does it mean to be together while we are apart? What kinds of social glue do we develop to do that? Um, how are we, on the flip side, are private and public or used to be private and public uh, and sort of what kinds of behaviors came out of that? Um, the second one is questions around community and sort of a feeling of belonging, uh, the question around membership, what are the conditions of membership for a certain community? Um, and how do we develop a sense of publicness and belonging for different kinds of communities that cluster around different kinds of activities, ideologies, goals, uh, kinship, you know, any kind of social ties. And the third point is really uh, about power. Uh, and, and, and policing and gatekeeping and thinking about publicness as a practice that is as much about uh, being open uh, and uh, making connections as it is about um, contesting uh, assumptions about a contested space, about friction, and along those lines very much uh, about uh, whiteness, uh, ideas coming out of white supremacy, um, policing along racial lines, who can be in, who can be out, and sort of really looking at how is this done? That's what I mean when I, when I say we need to look at publicness uh, as a practice, as something that is being done with materials, technologies, with certain skills and certain meanings behind. That's great. Um, and our audience tends to be mostly city practitioners, planners, um, official, you know, both in placemaking, as, as Lily had alluded to, and, and also just design. So um, for those folks that are, are joining us, please feel free to ask us questions. Um, in a little bit, we'll turn it over to Lily to, to, to gather some of the public questions, because this is a really uh, important conversation. Um, so then just real quickly, Mona, what are the kind of like big trends that you're seeing, like just in the, in the first couple of months of the, of the, of the COVID? Um, outbreak in terms of how we're acting as a public online? Great, great question, Lillian. Thank you. So um, I'm drawing, what, I, what I'm saying now is drawing on a research project that I'm currently directing, which is called Terra Incognita, whereby I have a wonderful team of researchers who are studying the emergence of digital public space uh, in New York City's lockdown. And um, I would say one of the main, the main themes uh, that we are seeing is really a close connection between, and I know we're going to talk about this later, between locality and local communities and how they are enacted digitally. So existing social ties, social connections uh, that are then sort of played out, deepened, expanded through technologies that become available and their affordances. And as part of that, also we're seeing a little bit of tinkering with the technology, moving maybe from one platform to the other, which we call platform switching to sort of see what works better and sort of what is more in line with one community over the other. We see like teachers, you know, teaching over Zoom, I teach over Zoom, and we have parents, WhatsApp groups. Um, as, in, as, as the protests uh, started to happen as part of the uh, 
Black Lives Matter movement, um, we're seeing a, a signal come up as a, a highly encrypted a new a platform used by more and more people. So there's a lot of movement, uh, movement going on. Another thing that we're seeing is a lot of programming. So we're seeing a lot of public institutions putting their program online like we do now or also what we do at NYU and sort of participation and an enactment of publicness happening that way that is quite interesting. Um, and so the third thing I'm gonna say is that we might wanna be a little careful about thinking uh, or uh, um, Think that this is all new. A lot of these digital spaces already existed prior to the lockdown, yeah. that they're now expanding uh, and they're, you know, changing their meaning and sort of uh, along those lines, again, we must be mindful of who does what together with whom and under what conditions, right? Who can participate yeah. and which sort of links to interesting conversations and important conversations about the digital divide and so on. Yeah, so definitely an acceleration of the use of a lot of these digital tools. And then you're right, a lot of platform usage, which um, I think is a great segue to uh, Warren and Detroit. So we definitely wanted to ground this conversation in what's happening in a city. And then it was interesting when I reached out to uh, the folks, the leadership of uh, Detroit um, in terms of their, their CIO, Beth Nylock, I was like, Beth, I want to talk a little bit about how you're engaging the public because I know they're making all these great efforts. And she's like, well, if you want to talk to someone, you got to talk to Warren. So Warren, um, tell us about what's happening in Detroit and in this context and how you're seeing folks engage digitally and um, and then also like the value of it if you could talk a little bit about because not every city is really actively trying to engage and build the muscles to engage their community digitally so uh, can you can you tell us what's happening in Detroit and why you see it being so valuable I'd love to thank you Lillian and Lily as well um, Mona and I we, we we can go on talking about these issues and we have and will um, for hours. Um, here in Detroit, um, Detroit's known um, as being the least connected city. So we're already starting from behind where even just catching up and doing um, the same is going to leave our folks well behind. Um, and we really saw with COVID coming around that um, the digital divide was really exacerbated in our city uh, and also created this real sense of urgency. But what has grown out of that is this beautiful coming together of um, all sectors in the community um, around tackling this digital divide, um, aiming for digital inclusion for all. Um, it's first started with a real effort to equip every single um, uh, Detroit public school student from K through 12 with an appropriate device and with connectivity at home so they can learn from home uh, for all 50,000 plus students. Um, it has really evolved into um, um, what about every other Detroiter um, that you know is at risk of being left behind? So, because we've been um, sort of starting from behind, um, we really are looking at well, what can we do in order to um, not only catch up but to leapfrog and be where where, where everyone's included? So, the second thing that has sort of come out of um, COVID was that negative um, exacerbation of the digital divide, but this opportunity. We really have seen two years of digital transformation happen in a span of two months which has opened up everyone's eyes and said, oh, what's possible? <laughs> and so that's created a little bit of an opening where partners like Microsoft and you know, other great partners, um, Google, Amazon are also heavily involved in the city. Of, um, we really have taken this community driven approach where how can we come alongside community efforts and um, enable them with, with technology, but really it's not us talking about the technology, it's really coming alongside the community to dream big, start small, iterate um, and then once we know that we have something figured out how to scale that quickly and so you have seen that happening and this is happening across Detroit as Mona said the the lens to see the work is not through a technology lens it's through that community lens and really how can we empower um, um, those in-person interactions in places in spaces um, we need to we need to as we're looking at the virtual um, side of that coin we need to keep in mind that this really is about those in-person interactions um, um, not about the technology itself. Yeah. Um, so can you give us a couple of quick examples and then maybe also talk a little bit about, um, I know this isn't, I mean, this has definitely been accelerated by COVID, but this is something you've been working on with the city over a while. So can you talk a little bit about those efforts and, and, and then for the audience again, what, what exactly does this look like of having technology work alongside the community? 
I'd love to. So um, we, we've really kind of come along in phases um, with the city. Um, again, piggybacking off of all that Mona had said, um, how we can come alongside the city uh, as well as the community partner, Data Driven Detroit, uh, a very, very strong organization that um, the reason why I lit up when I first met them is because um, um, they don't come at it from a data analytics firm. They really are a community organizing group that happens to be ridiculously good at data and analytics. So when I was looking at the efforts as they were coming alongside the city, um, how we could bolster their efforts to connect with residents, uh, really four phases uh, emerged. Number one was um, user feedback on city apps, because as we know, comfort level with apps could be a barrier. So how to make them as user friendly for all Detroiters as possible. Out of that came um, the, the, the kind of group, the civic user testing group um, that Data Driven Detroit um, powered on behalf of, of, of the city of, of Detroit to really help start trying to address that digital divide. Um, the second part then really kind of evolved from, well, how do we look at the digital divide as a whole? Um, and how do we resource and track um, collective impact that's happening in, in this digital inclusion space? Uh, and again, Data Driven Detroit stood up a Metro, data, uh, De Metro Detroit Data Alliance um, which uh, again really helped um, to um, not centralize, but to pool and coordinate as a resource the data across um, the spectrum. Uh, and then the third part that we're, we're, we're really excited about, which is how do we kind of transcend just looking at specific applications? And we're looking at how do we upgrade these physical community gathering places that already exist? with technology and programming to help folks access the digital landscape. So we're coming up with a, a series of hundreds of neighborhood tech hubs designated throughout the city uh, in order to help make it as easy as possible for residents who might not have equipment, uh, devices, connectivity at their home, be able to connect and to feel more comfortable with it. And then it's like, how do we transcend even these physical places and spaces? And that's where we're really coming alongside to empower people to digitally access their digital landscape through these community ambassadors, which are community organizers whose sole job it is, is to help residents become more comfortable using this technology um, for the betterment of their learning, um, their uh, employment, but also their well-being in life. That's great. Um, and so we're going to put a link out. I thought it'd be great to share with folks a link to the Data Driven Detroit Cut Group, like even just the intake form to see exactly how they're engaging the public in, in participating. Um, and this is a user testing group that the city has to actually test any new technology that's being deployed, it's just an easy way to, to engage. Um, so um, Obviously, uh, one of the key questions, I, I definitely want to move to this topic of localism and, and community, but one of the key questions that I know has been, you know, top of mind for everybody is this issue of privacy. Um, it's come up in the protests. Um, it's come up um, in, in both in the contact tracing context as well for COVID. Um, so, Mona, what are the kind of high level implications for our privacy? I, I know this could be like a conversation unto itself. But like, what are the high level implications for privacy in all of this? Um, and then you've written a little bit about this too. So we'll also put some links to some articles that you've talked about. Yeah, that's a big question, Lillian. Um, so I think um, maybe we want to backtrack a little bit and think about um, uh, what happens before we even ask questions around privacy, which I think uh, are important questions around uh, infrastructures and, and public versus private ownership of infrastructures and what, what happens. What are the governance structures that we have around these infrastructures? Who owns what in what way? And if they, is there democratic oversight? That's sort of the, the baseline, I think, that we need to look at first. And then, um, obviously, as we, as we sort of use these largely or mostly privately owned infrastructures uh, and centralized infrastructures as sort of the social glue that holds us together and that facilitates our social life in the lockdown, um, issues around uh, data extraction and, and privacy uh, come up. So and these can be very uh, technical and pragmatic and, and about security, how, how secure is Zoom, right? Can there be a Zoom bombing? What happens to uh, your cloud recording? Who owns the data? Can it, be, uh, can it be hacked? What happens to it? But then um, sort of leading on to that are really issues around again, sort of inequalities and equities and structures of power and oppression that are imbued into design processes and data analytic processes. So um, highly uh, surveyed communities, um, uh, immigrant communities, for example, or uh, communities of color who have been under, under surveillance, um, the question is, will this shift to the digital under this uh, particular ownership structure uh, uh, exacerbate, uh, exacerbate this 
surveillance and this policing and therefore the oppression. And that is not just related to privacy. When we, privacy, I know it's a very favorite, you know, a, 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 we love talking about privacy. Privacy, privacy related to, to data, right? And sort of a, a key mechanism that we have when we talk about privacy is a consent. And as we've seen with the GDPR, that does not always work so well because we don't really, can, can we really give consent to something we don't really understand? And what we don't understand then necessarily is how is this data being used to build models, which are predictions of the future, right? Um, that sort of live on beyond the data. So even when the data is being deleted, um, sort of harmful assumptions and patterns can live on that were sourced from this, from this data. Um, mm -hmm. I could talk about this forever, but um, these are sort of some of the concerns and thoughts that I have uh, related to that. However, what I will also say is that I do see um, with this sort of really rapid shift uh, into the digital space, um, uh, a rapidly uh, a growing uh, collective literacy and knowledge around that, um, that that is emerging, which kind of excites me because we're talking about it because we're experiencing Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, yeah. I think the dialogue, oh, sorry, go ahead, Lauren. I was just gonna say for, for Mona, that's exactly why I think um, the phases of work that we described is really important because it comes down to trust, right? So these phases not only help build trust between residents and the city, but by taking on as many different projects for us to all work together across sector um, and building up these small wins is really important because it builds trust between the organizations um, that are reaching out to residents as well, um, which in turn hopefully translates into more trust of how that data is being used to ensure that that privacy is being respected, that ethics is thought up first and foremost, um, and that it's being accessible for all, not just some. So maybe um, uh, kind of piggybacking off of that, Warren, you've talked about how essentially what we're doing is we're trying to take, so typically we try to take online activity offline and now what we're trying to do essentially is take all this offline activity, things that we would do in physical spaces in the public square, quote unquote, online. Um, can you tell us more about what that sort of shift means for you? What, and then again, what does that look like? Um, and, and, and some specifics, what are you seeing that looks like in community? And, and back to Mona's point earlier about this localism, like what is, what are some of the opportunities here? And then again, you know, for a lot of our city um, guests, you know, like what kind of things could we be thinking about doing in our community to kind of help that shift? I love that. Um, so number one, it really is about trying to make um, folks see technology as a tool, not as a solution. So too oftentimes it's thought of as a solution that I don't know how to do and therefore is not for me which in turn um, um, even furthers the, the distance between those who are able to use the tool to um, improve their quality of life versus those who aren't. So um, a lot of times also it's just talking about, well, it's the same as what you're doing in person. It just happens to be a slightly different way. One example that we use is, for example, with seniors um, who we are getting comfortable using, you know, FaceTime and talking to their grandchildren who might be afraid to visit them, knowing that once they get comfortable with that it's social interaction, they'll be more comfortable speaking with their doctor and doing telemedicine um, before they get sick. So we're really looking at how we can um, change that conversation um, and re really is anchoring it in what folks are doing offline. Um, and, and as well, um, um, we really want to make sure that we're meeting everyone where they're at, no matter where they are, so that no one is left behind. All too often before we would think of digital literacy as a thing that once you achieved it, check, it's all, all done and not as a spectrum. So we really want to make sure that we're addressing and have solutions for folks wherever they're on the spectrum to move them along the spectrum. Great. Now, Lily, I know we've got um, a, a set of questions in the Q&A. Um, so I don't know if you want to pull up some of those. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great conversation. Thanks, guys. Um, so, so there's a few questions that I want to um, I want to tease out. Um, so, so first, um, uh, and Warren, I'll start with you. Um, you, you. You talked about trust, um, and and one of um, our audience members um, commented um, and and posed a question too around how um, he's seen that it's really important to have in-person networks first before transitioning into the virtual space. Um, and so Warren, if you could start, like, is, that, is that really important first? And, and if you can comment on that, and Mona, I would love to hear your thoughts too. So it definitely is. Um, I think we sort of mentioned about two years of digital transformation happening in two months and it feeling, wait a minute, things didn't break down. Number two, there's some benefits to it. Um, so there's, there's sort of two things that I, I see there. Number one is, um, we, not, we need to not confuse this as being 
equivalent to in person. What we're doing right now is we're drawing down, we're borrowing from that social equity that we built up in person that we're able to use now that we're connecting with virtually. And we're getting to know people a little bit differently, right? Like I get to see someone's kids come into the picture and before they never talked about their kids at work. So we're actually like able to get to know them a little bit more, but that's because we're born from the social equity we built up in person. At some point that's gonna get depleted and it's gonna be go and it's gonna go back to being ineffective. So we need to figure out how to get back to enabling and empowering those in-person interactions to begin with, even though this feels as if it's yeah. it's easy. So I completely, completely ten thousand percent agree with that. Mm. Mona, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, uh, thanks for that, Lily uh, and Warren. Um, I would, first of all, I would absolutely uh, agree that uh, as a sociologist, that's what I observe and what I'm interested in. And this is really what is emerging as sort of an early insight from the Turing Creek Media Research Project that we are talking about existing social networks, interactions, ties that, by the way, can be super local, but that can also be global, right? Because, mm -hmm. like, the, the history of humanity is a history of migration, and people have ties all over the world that are a sort of now being uh, strengthened actually. Um, and sort of what we see is that some, you know, folks who have family abroad say, well, I, I'm closer now because everything is, you know, is virtual and I can attend, uh, you know, 4th of July dinner with my family, which we never did before. And like, I'm closer to them. I'm even closer uh, to public life in my city because I can go mm -hmm. to my local yoga studio. Uh, these mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, so that's one comment. The other comment is around trust. I do think trust is an important concept, but I, I think uh, we also need to complicate it a little bit and mm -hmm. ask what constitutes trust. Do we actually have uh, uh, a sufficient definition of that uh, and sort of who, who defines that for us? And what are the kinds of uh, processes and structures that we need in addition to trust, such as democratic oversight? transparency, equitability, and all these kinds of things. Um, uh, and sort of I am uh, cautioning us to think those and do those along the lines of building trust. Mm, mm, absolutely. Um, and, and so, so on, that, on that thread of, uh, you, you pointed out, you know, d defining trust, being able to understand what that means. I think that that's, that is, that's really important um, as, we're, as we're continuing into this, this virtual space. Um, so, so I, so one of the, one of the, the, the key places that we found that, that has tremendous trust is our libraries um, in our communities. And, and actually there is, uh, interesting enough, I didn't even think of this, there, there's a, a bunch of questions around libraries and how, how you, you two are thinking about potentially partnering um, or, or how, how do libraries play in this, in this world that we're talking about? Um, just quickly, uh, Warren, if you if you have any comments um, on that. Microsoft's working very closely with the American Libraries Association. Um, already over 200, I want to misquote, 278 um, different library districts have been equipped with Wi-Fi so they oh, can wow. extend that to the community. We've seen too often here in Detroit, um, but also in rural areas um, as well throughout the nation where um, people are pulling up to the parking lots at the libraries in order to access Wi-Fi. Um, so so um, it, number two as well is um, not only the place for knowledge, but also just the place for um, accessing um, social uh, uh, benefits of any sort. It really, they, the roles of libraries really are as that key community space. And I mm -hmm. love the fact that they've taken this broader lens. Um, and, and so we've, we're coming alongside their efforts as much as possible, recognizing that that is the place where, where community gathers. Absolutely. Mona, I'm going to just pivot a, a little bit because um, we're running out of time, but um, I'm going to ask you the, the final question um, that, um, that I thought was really interesting from, from the group. And there, there's a bunch more, so, so we can, um, we can, we can uh, respond on um, Twitter afterwards. Um, we'll, we'll put up your handles. Um, but um, there, there's a really interesting question around journalism. And, and of course, we know at night um, we're, we're, um, that is a, a major pillar of, of our work, too. Um, and, and what does, um, you know, this, this digital civic engagement um, mean for journalism? And if there's anything interesting that, that you're seeing um, around that. So Mona, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. And I love that question. Thank you for that. Um, so um, I'm just going to narrow it from my own experience. Uh, okay. And I'm going to say um, journalism is so important for, for, for a healthy society, for a healthy democracy. And I'm thrilled to see that it's, it's going strong uh, here. And so um, I find, I have way more interactions with journalists in the lockdown 
we're reaching out, we can sort of do these kinds of interactions, we can have conversations. There seems to be a, a really sort of a more close collaboration between journalism and sort of people like me who are uh, in the academy, but also community organizers, activists, uh, you know, community members generally. And I do think that is, that's something uh, really important to hold on to and to really closely observe how important journalism is for our society, critical journalism, really good investigative journalism, um, and that we sort of hold on to that uh, as we hopefully sort of reemerge uh, later on. So those are my two cents on journalism in the lockdown. Fantastic. Um, great. Well, I'm going to call in um, Lillian to, uh, to close this out. Yeah. Um, no, these are great questions. So there's a bunch of really great questions in the Q&A that we won't get to that talk about digital infrastructure and a little bit more on the digital divide. I'll maybe just um, tease out that in the in the coming weeks, we actually want to focus a whole um, a whole show on the digital divide because it's come up in all of our public spaces discussions. It's come up in the um, racial equity conversation and obviously here. So um, for our guests, please stay tuned for that one. Um, but perhaps just to close it out, Mona, um, and Warren, do you have any kind of just last provocation about like moving forward, um, especially if we're not technologists, um, but we're in this process of rebuilding our cities? Like, what's the one big thing that you know everyone should be uh, thinking about doing? Um, yeah, gotta let Warren go first for this one. Um, uh, really quickly, I've been surprised at how many different stakeholders who in the past may have had what seemed like selfish interests are leaning into the digital divide. So just really encouraging taking a, a growth mindset and an allyship for all approach, um, not necessarily an us versus them. Too often it feels like us versus them, but um, in Detroit here, it's really nice to see everyone coming alongside and lending um, their resources and expertise where they can in surprising ways. Great. Yeah, and I would just add, endorse that and second that and add on to that and saying one of the main uh, trends that I'm seeing and that I'm uh, excited about both uh, as an intellectual but also as a person is kind of uh, this localism that I keep talking about, this decentralized community building uh, and, and sort of coming together, but not in a, in a sense of, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, really closing up and so it's just us against them but I see uh, an opening up happening as this happens which I'm really excited about as a cultural shift um, and I do see uh, and I'm hopeful for things like different kinds of literacy happening as part of that and building sort of local networks both like literally networks uh, but also networks of mutual aid of support uh, and so on and that's what I, I think is a trend that puts cities back firmly back on the map and local communities firmly back on the map uh, that I'm excited about. Uh, and yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. Okay. Well, definitely. Well, thank you both. Um, I think definitely the thing I'm taking away is that we've got to build on the social equity that we've built in these physical spaces, and let's let's not be afraid by let's not be afraid of the digital, and let's let's figure out how we take that um, that connection and that community. Um, digital so that we don't lose these ties as we're sheltering in place. Um, so thank you very much, um, both of you. Um, for those that are still on, um, as Lily mentioned, um, I, Mona, you're active on Twitter. So if folks have any more questions for you, you're at Mona underscore Sloan. Um, so folks can find you there and it's in the chat. Um, and then please join us next week. Um, we're going to talk, we're going to sort of take this digital trend forward and talk a little bit about mobility, which has been a huge topic of conversation for us. And we'll be joined by Anthony Townsend, who talks a lot about the shift moving towards autonomy in mobility. And then we'll also talk to Warren Logan from the city of Oakland, who is their mobility policy lead. And we'll think through how, what, what does mobility look like as we try to rebuild from COVID and how do we make sure we do it equitably and how do we make sure we're also like really taking advantage of the technology that's out there. So please um, join us next week. Um, but thank you all. Thank you, Lily, for joining again. Hey. And we'll see you all Thanks next week. So see you next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Bye. Bye.